Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Rosenthal Theater at the Inner City Arts. How's everybody doing tonight? I'm Ashley Alvarado, Manager of Public Engagement for KPCC. We're an NPR affiliate here in LA. And I'm John Cohn, Managing Producer of KPCC In Person, KPCC's events and engagement platform. And because in public radio, we're all about polls and surveys, by a quick round of applause, how many of you are KPCC listeners? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for listening. One more round of applause. How many of you are checking out a KPCC event for the first time? That was kind of close. That was pretty, pretty, pretty close. Um, we're here because Southern California is full of untold stories and even more that go unheard. And we wanted to change that. So Unheard LA, the stories of where you live, was born. We began by reaching out to people and asking a simple question. Tell us a story about you or your community in whatever format feels best. Now, our focus was on the substance of the story and the way it related to life in Southern California. That could be music, visuals, poetry, essay. We received over 250 submissions. And then we had the difficult task of figuring out who we were going to feature in this brand new series. But here we are. Some of the folks you'll see tonight have never been on stage before. Some have. But all were game to share their stories as a way to celebrate and illuminate the diversity and complexity of our region. So essentially, real people amplified. Now, each show is unique because of who's involved and where we are. And I would say that tonight has a little bit more of a gritty, artsy flair. And as these experiences are recounted by those that live them, they inevitably include a range of observations and perspectives. And as a non-advocacy, non-partisan media organization, just a reminder that what you hear and see today is reflective of our courageous community storytellers and not an endorsement by KPCC. We had to say that. We had to. <laughs> Thank you to the California Wellness Foundation for supporting this project and making Unheard LA possible. KPCC is on air, online, and in person. So for today's show, we are live video streaming, Facebook living, and audio recording for broadcast, which means you're welcome to use your devices. We just ask that you silence them, maybe lower your screen brightness, Photos are okay, but please, no flash, no audio or video recording. We got that covered. We encourage you to engage with us on social media. We're at KPCC in person, and tonight we're using the hashtag UnheardLA. I think that's all the housekeeping, right? Perfect. So no show would be complete without a host. So please join me in welcoming actor, writer, Watts Village Theater Company, artistic director, Nate Evangelino, and your host of Unheard LA, Bruce Lemon. What's up, L.A.? Oh, what's up, L.A.? There we go. How's everybody doing today, huh? Good? Good? Nice. Well, uh, welcome to the Rosenthal Theater here at Inner City Arts. Uh, this space is typically occupied by very small humans. Uh, you are a scotch bigger than that group. Uh, they bust young Angelinos in here by the busloads to learn performance art and media arts and visual arts, and I sincerely hope you're just as curious and willing to explore. Uh, maybe think of yourself as really large children today. Uh, my name is Bruce Lemon. I will be your host and tour guide for the evening. I'm a son of Watts. I'm a storyteller. I represent the East Side, South Central in the house. And uh, here, where we're standing right now, thank you, where we're standing right now, I am a 13-year-old kid. Don't let the peach fuzz fool you. This is where I play. All right, welcome to our second Unheard LA. Just to get a feel for who's in the room, uh, where are you from? Originally, originally, New York. New York, nice, nice. Who else, who else we got here? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay in my light and reach to you. Where are you from? Seattle. Seattle, nice, okay. Well, let's see what else we got. On the count of three, I need everybody to shout out where you're from, and that could be uh, where you live, where you were born, what you do, whatever really means to you, okay? Ready? One, two, three, go. Venezuela. I heard Venezuela. Nice. All right. <laughs> nice. Nice. All right. Now, this is one of the most diverse places in the world. You can see it in the streets. You can see it at work. You can see it at school. 
Unfortunately, though, you don't see an accurate reflection on TV and film. This past February, the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at UCLA released the 2017 Hollywood Diversity Report, setting the record straight. Now, according to this report, diverse casting in television and film leads to higher ratings and increased ticket sales, but women and minorities are still underrepresented. Most of you probably didn't need a study to tell you that. The evidence is in the shows you watch and the films you don't. So please join me to the stage. Please join me and welcome me to the stage. It's live. Will Choi. I'm from Cerritos. Uh, it's a wonderful place that's really diverse, like super diverse. Like my high school was 90% Asian diverse. <laughs> I made up that statistic, but it's pretty close. <laughs> I grew up around a lot of different races, and even within Asian Americans, it was really diverse. Uh, I was surrounded by Filipinos, Chinese, Indian, Korean, Japanese people. So um, my upbringing was pretty different than what I saw in TV and in movies. I didn't see that many Asians, uh, Asian Americans on screen or in media growing up, and whenever I did see one, they weren't Asian. What do I mean by that? For example, I used to think Robin from Batman and Robin was Asian. He had black hair. Or Jughead from Archie Comics was Asian. Once again, black hair. And Bobby from Bobby's World was Asian. You guessed it, black hair. They basically looked Asian, and I knew that they weren't actually, but I had to use my imagination to feel that I could be included in those worlds. Which, okay, you know who can definitely be Asian? Peter Parker from, or Spider-Man. Guys, hear me out. Hollywood is always rebooting movies, but don't the re reboots always kind of seem like the same thing over and over again? I think if they rebooted Spider-Man with an Asian Peter Parker, it would totally make sense. He's basically a white Asian guy. <laughs> He's from New York, which has a huge Asian population. He likes science, math, and photography. I mean, come on. <laughs> and just call him Peter Park, and there you have it. <laughs> Imagination, you guys. So growing up with so much diversity around me, especially in high school, I saw in person that Asian Americans can really be anything. They were the artists, the prom kings and queens, the smart, ki smart kids, the drama kids, the jocks, the gots, the class presidents. I was one. And yet, they were all so much beyond those tropes. And I saw everyone around me being multifaceted, three-dimensional human beings. They were the kids who had found the loves of their lives, who had lost parents, who had big dreams of saving the earth, who struggled with find, finding their identities, things that make us ultimately human. But when I got older and watched Asians portrayed on TV and film, that wasn't the case. Asians and Asian Americans were mocked for having accents, the way that we looked, or only knowing karate. So our, other, our otherness of being Asian and the stereotypes that were portrayed about us didn't resonate with me at all. My life was changed when I saw my first long form improv show. Improv is acting without knowing any lines beforehand. It's all made up at that very moment on stage. And I saw a Korean-American improviser and thought, wait, we can do that? <laughs> I fell in love with improv. To see people think so quickly on their feet and to create interesting stories was something that I thought was impossible for me to learn. After about a year of watching shows, I decided I'd try it on for myself. I was terrified. Improv is scary. But I'm so glad I didn't let that fear take over I've been studying improv and performing for about five years now. In May 2016, a movie called Ghost in the Shell was being promoted. And Scarlett Johansson, a white actress, was cast as a character from a Japanese anime. I decided that I would tackle this long-time long issue of Hollywood's whitewashing of Asian roles in a comedic way. 
and took it upon myself to create the very first Asian American improv show at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in Los Angeles. A lot of people don't know this, even some Asian people, but May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, or AAPI Heritage Month, or APAM. So I created a show called Scarlett Johansson Presents AAPI Heritage Month. <laughs> it's clever, right? <laughs> I knew three other Asian American improv teams, so I figured this could work. Within a few days of creating a Facebook event for the show, so many people had RSVP, RSVP to it. I'm talking thousands. And Scarlett Johansson Presents became one of the most attended, if not the most attended show at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. I thought to myself, how could a little comedy show featuring Asian Americans reach that level? And somehow people were really into it. The subsequent Scarlett Johansson Presents shows, which coincide with all the opening nights of similarly controversial movies like Doctor Strange, The Great Wall, Ghost in the Shell, have continued to be incredibly successful, which also led to another show on the UCB Sunset main stage called Asian AF, which I also produce. The very first Asian American variety show at the UCB Theater. We continue to sell out shows in a matter of days and have even been featured on KPCC before. This conversation about representation is very important for a lot of people. And how do I know this? A recent t-shirt that I put out to help raise money for Asian AF went viral on the internet a few weeks ago. An actress named Michelle Celine Ang from the Netflix show 13 Reasons Why wore the shirt and it's, it seemingly exploded on the internet. It has four names on it, Scarlett, Emma, Tilda, Matt. And if you get it, you get it. <laughs> to call out famous examples of whitewashing and the white savior complex, that we as Asian Americans are so used to hearing about. Stories about Asian culture are used as set pieces. Asian characters are erased. And we as Asian Americans are not included in a lot of these stories. It's frustrating, yes, and the topic is one that can go on for hours. But at Scarlett Johansson Presents and Asian AF, we're trying to show that Asian American actors are here and we're killing it in the LA comedy scene and we're just waiting for Hollywood to catch up to us. Thank you. I'll catch up. Little Saigon, Orange County, is home to around 200,000 Vietnamese and Vietnamese Americans. In fact, Southern California has the largest population of Vietnamese people outside of Vietnam. But we all know that identity is more than just a box you check, and it can be expressed in a range of ways. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Lisa Denny. I am a transplant from east to west, from Georgia to California, from Atlanta to Westminster. I am also a refugee who came with the third wave of Vietnamese immigrants escaping political persecution in the 90s. I wrote the poem you're about to hear at a time when I found myself lost in my identity, when I felt confined by my race after the election, coming home to see my elderly parents sob with fears and feelings of defenselessness. A response to a government that seemed to only want to ostracize them in a world where there was already a clear racial hierarchy, while my youthful white friends marched for something they couldn't fully explain. It was a time of simultaneously feeling misunderstood while not understanding my own identity in the United States as a Vietnamese American. So this poem is about reconciling the East and the West, Westminster and the Vietnamese community, the restraints race may have on identity. And if I'm being honest, a lot of it is about me. <laughs> but maybe, and I hope this is true, a little bit is about you too. Not. You are not. Communist history, capitalism, bought. Written in textbooks, the war in, not on Vietnam. Strings, vibrating things, 
potential life stories, lived, lost, forgot. Ties, East meets West. American, Asian, colonialism, wars, strapped to my chest. Victoria's secret bombshell, I'm doing my best. Media makes you wanna be seen. Asian import models looking like preteens. Gong I, I cry, unsure of my past. Why is it only feelings of knots that last? Why do we go on racing past our past? Westminster still holds on to their past. Quick schemes and politics not meant to last. Population, 30,000, with no representation to cast. Vietnam in technicolor there. You say, go home, and I say, where? Le Miserable didn't include Indochine. And I, I feel like a machine. Tempered by boxes, are you yellow or seen? Knots of all colors, shading my dreams. Choking on knots, systemic or not. It's all that we've got. Between two worlds, I'm tied like a knot. I am and I'm not. But don't feel so bad. It's not quite that bad. Racism over radicalism, I'm actually glad. Don't be confused. Our bodies are only bruised. Mind bemused. All the battles we fought constant tangles and thought, who am I? Who are we? Two worlds, one convoluted body, caught. As we think about our home and where we're going, where we've been, I, I think it's important to note that today is the second day of the 25th anniversary of the LA riots. Was anybody out here around during the civil unrest? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Do you remember it? I, I do. I was seven years old. A kid, just like the ones that come in here daily, I just wanted to go outside and play, but we were reminded of the deadly consequences of being caught outside after the 7 p.m. curfew. And I remember sitting on the floor because you know we had to stay low in case of gunfire, and we're watching the news, and there's a church's chicken restaurant burning on the news. So I got up, and I walked to the window and pulled the curtain back, and I watched that same church's chicken burning on the corner. These images are ingrained in my brain, etched in my mind. An enduring reminder of where I'm from and they follow me wherever I'm going. Here to share a bit of what she's carried, please welcome to the stage, Rachel Sumac. My family moved to Los Angeles from Iran in the 1980s with little to their names. It was around the time of the Iranian Revolution, and for those of you who have not seen Ben Affleck in Argo, it was a pretty hostile place to live, especially if you were Jewish like my parents were. It was that that drove my mother to spend several nights through the, through, through the desert by Camelback to seek refuge in Pakistan then go to Israel and become a refugee and eventually come to the United States. Just like about 30,000 other Iranian Jews, my parents fled religious persecution and came to rebuild their lives and communities here in Los Angeles. In many ways, my sister and I watched our parents build what we have today with, with nothing and with no shame. Even though my father had his master's degree in engineering, I saw him take up careers in everything from door-to-door -door sales to real estate to technology until he found his stride in fabrics. With two parents always working, my sister and I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's home. She has a quaint two-bedroom right off of Ventura Boulevard and Lindley Avenue in the Valley. 
My grandmother stands at a respectable 5'1 and is never one to keep her opinion to herself. And it might be her hearing aid, but I don't think she understands the concept of whispering. And she <laughs> is a one who has an extremely roarous voice and laugh. And then there is my grandfather, Solomon. In Farsi, grandfather is Baba Jun. Try it with me, Baba Jun. Nice, nice. Uh, <laughs> and my Baba Jun had the stature of a football player, standing at 6'1", a large, textured, leathery face with ears to match drooping on the side. I loved my Baba Jun. He was stoic, yet always grinning. He spoke six languages, Hindi, Armenian, English, Hebrew, Arabic, and Farsi, because his work for the oil company involved international partners, and he wanted to build authentic relationships. He wanted to know the slang that the shipmates used and what it meant and how to respond right back in their native tongue, having them feel at home while away. He brought his language books with him to the States, and I have a few of them facing out on my shelf at home. He was in many ways the opposite of my grandmother, yet their relationship was my favorite. As a pretty studious child, I often found myself gravitating towards him, as even in his 80s, he would spend his afternoons rewriting things from English to Hebrew to Persian, and then handing those pages of script to my dad or my uncle to make copies so that he can hand out to us, his grandchildren, so we can stay exposed to the language. One day, as my Baba Jun scribed, I noticed something on his forearm. It could have passed as a mole, but it was a little too flat and a little off-colored. And when I asked him what it was, he put his pen down and turned his body towards his small 10-year-old granddaughter. I received this when I was 17 and right before I was sent to the army, he said. And he began telling me the story of his mother, my great-grandmother, who took parsley and squeezed the parsley juice down to its core and began to poke and prod his skin with a needle, leaving the small circle tattoo. He said it was a reminder of home. I guess when you don't have emails or text messages to remind someone of home, a tattoo will have to do. I was actually sharing this story with my little cousin, and she said, so it's like the opposite of a Snapchat. <laughs> um, three years after that conversation, I remember going to my eighth grade English teacher, Ms. Spivak, at Portola Middle School, and letting her know that I was missing class the next day, because my grandfather had passed, and we were holding his memorial. I asked my father if I could speak at the memorial, and my father, in many ways, was a reflection of my grandfather. Always quiet and an observer, he's actually here tonight, uh, but never missed an opportunity to bring lighthearted joy into the room. He agreed to my request, and soon I was standing in front of 300 teary-eyed people, and the person who had spoken before me <laughs> shared a very somber, heartfelt Persian poem. And now I, a 13-year-old, with a mouthful of braces adorned with turquoise bands <laughs> in a polite black dress, took the stage. And I shared the story of my Baba Jun, the brilliant bilingual backgammon champion, and then took a couple minutes to indulge in the story of his badass tattoo. This is how I felt I would honor his spirit. It's now been 12 years since his passing, and a part of him that stayed with me the most is this tattoo and what that meant. In fact, I often think about how the sentiment could stay with me more permanently. Fortunately, my last name is my grandfather's last name, which is Sumach. And even though we're Persian, it's a Hebrew word which means to lift the fallen, as if helping someone who might need a hand. And I've turned, <laughs> it's turned out that I've spent my entire adult life in the social impact nonprofit space, trying to live up to this name. The organization I co-founded in college has thrived, allowing us to provide hundreds of thousands of meals to college students and needy individuals. And we've gained recognition from President Obama, the New York Times, and it recently landed me on the 2017 Forbes 30 Under 30 list. <laughs> <laughs> But as I share about the life of my Baba June, 
I can't help but think that what would really make him proud would be my own version of that reminder tattoo. Something that would serve as a constant reminder that the world, like it did for my Baba June, will take me to unfamiliar, exciting, and far-flung places. But in the end, what might sustain me when I get there is something that reminds me of home. Thank you. Nice. Nobody saw that. The first time I sat down with Dolores Chavez, the director of the theater you're sitting in right now, she signed up uh, my company, Watts Village, to perform in their 25th anniversary celebration. They invited 25 artists to react to 25 pieces of art created by the many students who call Inner City Arts their artistic home. She gave me these clay figures, and they were sitting in chairs. The kids made them. They looked like they were passing down information and knowledge from one generation to the next, and I instantly felt that spark of creativity. Since then, I've had the pleasure of working with and performing for hundreds of those students, talented young people who have no doubt taught me far more than I could ever teach them. The Rosenthal Theater builds itself as a creative home for innovative and diverse performance. This place is here to illuminate the creative spirit of young people and adults like you and I by enabling us to create, present, and experience new work. I can attest to the truth of that claim because I've experienced it firsthand. Founded by an artist and inventor, Bob Bates, possibly the coolest person you'll ever meet in a bubble vest, <laughs> he was told in a vision to get an art space for kids. Then he set out with businessman and entrepreneur Irv Yeager to realize his vision. They opened Inner City Arts in 1989 to 60 at-risk youth here in Skid Row, giving them a place to creatively explore, learn, and grow. Well, today, no longer a small studio space on Olympic Boulevard, Inner City Arts is a fortress of artistic wanderlust, having served over 200,000 students and 10,000 teachers in the Los Angeles area. Thank you, Dolores, and the folks at Inner City Arts for your commitment to Los Angeles and for hosting us here today. And speaking of artists, LA is full of them. Many of today's storytellers, for example, or perhaps your Lyft driver who on the way here invited you to their concert or stage reading at the bar down the street, or maybe even some of you're sitting next to right now. Some actively employed in their field, others seeking out creative gratification between survival gigs. You'll never know what or who inspiration will come from, but two things are for sure. Still sharpen still, and practice makes perfect. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Alex Wan. Song A Day is a music community that my brother and I started three years ago. The challenge is to compose original songs every day for a month and upload them on songadayformonth.com. The idea came to me after learning about the story of Woody Guthrie's Columbia River Ballads. In 1941, the US government commissioned Woody Guthrie to write music about the Pacific Northwest. During his month-long visit, he wrote the 26 songs that comprise of the Columbia River Ballads. This got me inspired to challenge my own creative output in a similar way, to write a song every day for a month. My brother and I developed the website to create a platform for this in 2014. And since then, we've had biannual song-a-day sessions every January and July, where participants have collectively composed over 4,000 songs. My story weaves some of these songs together to create a glimpse into the world of song day. For one month, I break with ordinary life and commit to writing a song every day. The story begins with day one. Dream song I found you Peeking through the window with a force 
remember when you sold your soul to the devil's throne as she grabbed your throat and tore it through just for you. I'm in search for the dream song. In search for the electric blue of inspiration. The electric blue of inspiration! So, I give it a shot. I wake up, it's early morning. Pick up the guitar, start playing a melody. And I see the sunrise. The sun is always shining above the clouds. I take a walk, and I'm approaching a ridge when I see a woman. I strike up a conversation with this woman. I tell her about the project, and she asks me, how do you do it? I mean, how do you write a song every day? I say, well, there's several approaches. There's the days when something of note happens and you write a song about it. Like the day I decided to sell my car and become... Carlos in LA. Carlos in LA. Or like the time I went to see Star Wars with my sister. Everybody close the car doors. Put the key in the ignition. We're going to see Star Wars, special edition. <laughs> when I had that sore throat, I just couldn't shake. Sometimes the uh, songs will be purely musical experiments. Like when I asked, what does four guitars playing in different tempos sound like? Or the time when my lyrics comprised of a series of syllables I just made up that day. Oh, remember this awkward, so awkward, baby, so awesome. oh, remember this awkward. And there are days when there are these unexpected moments of inspiration where you break into song during a traffic jam, for example. <laughs> But it's not all sunshine and roses. I mean, I have days that are hard where my inner critic gets the best of me. But then you realize that in the end, they aren't giving prizes out. It's not about writing a good song or a bad song. It's about the process of writing a song itself. On song a day, you're celebrated no matter what your song is that day. You're celebrated for the fact that you are participating, that you're sharing in this experience with 30 or so musicians who are pushing and inspiring each other to be creative every single day. So the woman on the ridge listens to all this. She thanks me, walks back home. She's thinking about the project. She says, hey, shoot, I can sing. I mean, can I join? She's toying with the idea of doing the project herself. It's still day one. She could really do it. So she gets home. She writes a song, logs onto the website, makes an alias, and she uploads the song. Yeah. 
And the comments stream in, quote, beautiful reverie, welcome to song a day. Another one says, lovely harmonies in recording. The woman on the ridge makes her song a day debut, the beginning of a journey that has led her to compose a prolific 93 songs since, and hopefully many more to come. Thank you. Demo. <laughs> America is made up of so many cultures. Many come here, many born here or brought here. Some came with nothing more than what they could carry and established the breadth of vibrant and diverse communities most clearly represented here in Southern California. Within those communities, the makeup of a people is even more colorful with different hues, shades, and meanings. And within that so-called understood, you'll find a lot that's unexpected. Here to share her experiences through two pieces of poetry, please welcome Taz Ahmed. Belongings. Partition was my grandfather's Muslim ban. In 1948, my 21-year-old Nana escaped Kolkata, a Bengali Muslim on the flea, a student under dormitory arrest pretending to celebrate under the rainbow cover of Holi. He left with all he could fit inconspicuously into his knapsack. He disappeared across the Ganges, he reappeared days later on a plane landing in Dhaka with nothing but all he could carry. During Bangladesh's independence, my mother was a Bengal third world refugee. At 16 years old, in Lahore, she left behind all of her things, her clothes, her books, her home, her friends, her community. All she could take was all she could carry in her one suitcase back east. They fled in 1972 after my Nana was released from the concentration camps. The family caught the first flight back out to Dhaka. As a child, I had wondered why she couldn't just go back and retrieve her things. They were hers after all. When she died, we found her stamp collection from when she was a kid. She had kept them with her throughout her life, a collection that had gone around the world. She had always wanted to travel. My 20-year-old father immigrated to the United States, an economic migrant on an engineering visa. He was in the first wave of Bengali students after 1965's Immigration Act. On the around the world flight, he came with two suitcases filled with the necessities for starting over, probably with some spicy masala, probably with some sweet gore. When he landed in Los Angeles, he shared a place with eight other men staying on Western and Third in what is now known as Little Bangladesh. He sold his first house for $25,000 to pay for the wedding where he was arranged to marry my mother. He brought her over from Bangladesh to LA in 1979, and in her belly, I was the four-month-old fetus she carried. In 2017, I know better than to attach meanings to objects and things. I know better than to think capitalism holds my people secure. And I wonder just how many bags I'll be allowed and just how much I'll be able to carry. And if all I can carry are these memories, where does this legacy lead me? Where does it leave me? What year will it be? Thank you. This one's called brown. What color is my skin? It is brown, 
Coffee, almond, chocolate, dirt, earth, ground. It is the color of melanin, the color of muddy monsoon puddles and centuries of rice paddy fields. It is the color of decades of migration and of, I like the color of your tan. <laughs> when my teamster working mother would come home from a long day of work in the Los Angeles summer sun, she'd extend her forearms to me and say, look at how dark I got. Look at how brown I got. I'd look, her chubby fingers calloused, her arms worked and tired, and her brown skin was lived and beautiful. She survived till she couldn't. She gave me this brown skin. My skin is the brown color of insulted looks from other browns. For when I say, sorry, I don't speak your language, because this is the kind of brown that makes everyone think I should speak their own brown mother tongue. It is the brown skin of kinship. My skin is also the brown color of speak English here, when in my reality, my Bangla pigeon tongue was formerly trained in nothing else. This brown skin is the color of Manzanar, Tijuana, Angel Island. It is the color of Mughal Empire, East India Trading Company, West Bengal, and Bangladesh. My skin is the color of Guantanamo Bay, Standing Rock, Flint, and Ferguson, of borders, airports, and detention centers. It is the color of go back to your own country and getting shot in the driveway for wearing a turban. It is the color of being murdered in a bar and then later being told, you're Indian, my bad, I thought you were Iranian. It is being asked on a plane if you are carrying bombs in your bag and that all the illegals need to get out. My skin is brown, and I am a Muslim woman, and I don't need your solidarity. I need you to believe in my intersectional humanity, that survival is transnational, borderless, and migratory, that our liberations are intertwined. My skin is brown, like the poetry scratched into the walls, prayers carved into dirt floors, prose on protest signs, my skin is brown. My humanity deserves no loyalty test. They have painted my skin with the color of fear. Make no mistakes. It only goes skin deep. This brown is the color of resistance. Thank you. I hate to choose, or more specifically, I hate to choose between two things I love. So if I don't have to, I won't. I mean, I'll pay to get two meats on my burrito. I will, I will. I'll wear my watch and my Fitbit at the same time. I know, gross, right? My favorite pair of pants are sweats and khakis at the same time. Look at these things. Our next storyteller can relate. Please welcome to the stage, Glenn Fernandez.
I am an emergency room doctor. <laughs> also, I'm an opera singer. I've been asked many questions about the duality of this kind of lifestyle. Are you a singing surgeon? Do you sing to your patients? How has being a musician helped your doctoring skills? And I absolutely hated it when my professors in med school would use the phrase, the art of medicine. <laughs> Trust me, if I ever have to put a tube in your chest to fix a collapsed lung, you do not want me to get artsy with it. <laughs> so why do these questions annoy me? Because as both a physician and a professional artist, I can tell you that these two fields have almost nothing in common. It's a nice poetic idea that these two very opposing worlds can somehow thrive when pushed together but I've spent many years attempting to create an amalgamation for art and medicine. I found that it doesn't work for me. And I've tried in the past. Tulane School of Medicine actively seeks students that have an artistic side. I did the usual things one would expect to prepare for their med school interview, but I also did a little extra. I prepared a song to perform. I have dreamed from the king and I. <laughs> I nailed the audition and was accepted into med school. Throughout med school, I thought I would be able to discover some secret alchemical formula for combining the two worlds of music and medicine that would lead to some kind of revelation for humanity. But that never happened. I finally realized during my ER residency during Sh in Shreveport, Louisiana, that music and medicine, for me, were meant to be two separate realms. After a long week of 12-hour shifts in the ER, I would look forward to the escape of my one-hour voice lessons. Shreveport Opera even let me sit in the theater during rehearsals for Cinderella after my shifts. Although my body was dead tired, my mind needed these mental breaks. I sang in the church choir at St. Joseph's Catholic Church in my spare time. It was such a relief to spend time talking about which hymns to perform instead of which blood tests to order. Although I did find myself sometimes reflexively referring to the hymn numbers as bed numbers out of habit. <laughs> I would escape from the stress of seeing gunshot wounds, car accident victims, and dying children by traveling to that very separate world of music. During those three years as a resident, surrounded by the ugliness and suffering that one can only find in an emergency room, I was so stressed. <laughs> Also, I had this scary feeling that I was wasting time being away from the music world. I was terrified that at the end of those three years, I would end up with a degree to show that I was an ER doctor, but I would have nothing to prove that I was still a real musician. And from all the death I've seen, I know that lost time is something you cannot resuscitate. So I decided to create a concert in Shreveport called Ave Maria. The concert was able to provide an escape for me and for that audience. It brought people together from the hospital community and the music community together in that one space for one hour. The program for that recital turned into my new album, Ave Maria, a collection of classic opera blended with modern instrumentation. So after moving to LA and working simultaneously as an ER doctor and singer, I'm now being asked a new question by the nurses and PAs that I work with. When are you going to quit medicine to perform full-time? <laughs> I realize now that while living the grind of being a singer-actor in Los Angeles, I need to escape to those 12-hour shifts. 
where I don't have to think about my next performance or my next concert. I don't believe I would totally give up working shifts in the ER no matter how busy I get at singing and acting. For me, these two worlds will never merge. They must remain separate for both to exist. Without medicine, my patients couldn't survive. Without music, I couldn't live. Charles Bukowski was one of the most original voices of 20th century American literature. An outsider on the periphery of both society and the literary establishment, he said, the place to find the center is at the edge. And here, in his home city of Los Angeles, he continues to attract a huge following of readers and young writers to the edge in search of their voice. Here to share her journey, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Hazel Lopez. <laughs> There's a bluebird in my heart and it wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. That was the first line of the first poem by Charles Bukowski that I read ever, and I was in love. A few years ago, a good friend of mine decided to introduce me to the literature of Charles Bukowski. In her mind, she thought, well, he's an LA native, a drunken writer, and a dirty old man, and clearly that's your type, so <laughs> here you go. <laughs> and she gifted me a book. And she was right. And over the next few months, I devoured his novels and poetry books until it wasn't enough. I was obsessed. I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more about Charles Bukowski, not who he was as a writer, but more so as a person. So I started to do research. And in my research, I found out that Charles Bukowski, Charles Bukowski was an admirer of another great writer by the name of John Fonte, and that the two had actually become friends and drunks at this one bar called the King Eddie Saloon. <laughs> so I came up with this brilliant idea. I decided that I was going to go to this bar, I was going to become regular and a drunk there, and then I was going to somehow absorb all this inspiration, and then I was going to make something with it. <laughs> <laughs> One night, I walked into the bar just randomly, like on a Tuesday, and for the next year and a half, I never left. It was at this bar where I met Bob. Bob was a 76-year-old regular who had been drinking at this bar for like the last 30 years. He always sat in the same bar stool in the same corner of the bar. On the first night that I walked in, he looked me over and he asked, excuse me, miss, do you know where you are? Do you know that this is Skid Row and it's a dangerous place for a woman like you? To which I said, okay, well, first of all, I work at a nonprofit in Skid Row, so I'm not afraid. And secondly, have you heard of Charles Bukowski? <laughs> So I proceeded to recite the Bluebird poem word for word, and at the end of it, Bob, who was completely unimpressed, uh, motioned me to come sit next to him. So I did, and then he started to tell me stories. He told me stories about the war and how he was stationed in Vietnam for a time. He told me that he had actually been a bar owner himself, but that he had learned that there's a fine line between being a drunk and an alcoholic. A drunk functions, he said. An alcoholic, not so much. And it was because of that life lesson that he ended up losing his bar and his home and eventually found his way down to Skid Row. As time went on, the stories that he shared with me became more intimate. He told me stories about the four women he had fallen in love with over the course of his life, how he still thought of them, how he should have married the second one, but that commitment frightened him, which is why he never had any kids and never got married. Bob also told me stories about LA's past. He talked to me about the Brown Derby in the Ambassador Hotel where Kennedy was shot. He told me how MacArthur Park was supposed to be LA's version of New York's Grand Central Park and how it was for a time, um, and how we had the red car and how the red car was supposed to be LA's version of the trolleys in San Francisco. He said that if I looked hard enough, I could still see the grooves in the cement where the tracks used to be down Main Street and Broadway. After a year of stories and drinking besides Bob three nights a week, I felt like I had come to learn and love LA through all the places that didn't exist anymore, an intimate history of the changing city. And then we found out that the bar had been sold to new management and it was going to close by the end of the year for renovation. So for weeks leading up to the closure, I would show up to the bar, 
I would get really drunk, more than usual, and then I would go into these rants about how gentrification was ruining all the things that I love and how it wasn't fair. And every time I would do this, Bob would calmly reassure me as if he'd seen this all before. He'd say, you know, back in the day, downtown was the place where it was all happening and where everyone wanted to be. And over the last few decades, it's decayed. But you'll see, he said, you'll see this place decay in your lifetime because it did once and it will again. History, Bob said, moves on the tracks of one giant loop. On closing night at the King Eddie Saloon, all the regulars were there. When last call came at 2 a.m., the bartenders who were drunk themselves decided to instate a new rule. The rule was the bar was going to stay open until the last drop of alcohol was consumed or <laughs> until the last patron left. Um, once you walked out the front doors, that's it. You were out. You couldn't come back in. So naturally, we all kept drinking. When 6 a.m. hit, I got behind the bar and I decided to serve Bob his official last drink. I served him a shot glass of whiskey, a shot glass of olives, and a tall glass of beer. And then I made my own drink. I looked at Bob and I said, you know what, Bob? I've been thinking about this. And in a few years, I want to be a regular at a CD bar somewhere. I want to be part of the fabric of that place. I want to be the glue that holds all these stories and histories together long enough to impart that wisdom on some young person. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, I just want to be you. <laughs> Bob looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> no. No, he said. The day that I sat down on this bar stool and started telling stories was the day that I stopped living my life. And that is not for you. You need to go. You need to go and jump planes and travel. You need to kiss many boys. You need to allow yourself the opportunity to be silly and fall in and out of love over and over and over again. You need to do things just because you can. You don't need reasons for why you do things, and more importantly, don't wait. The biggest mistake you can make is thinking you have the time, so don't wait, and just go. I didn't know what to say or how to even react to that, so I said, okay, I'll go, but first, we're going to exchange phone numbers, and we're going to keep in touch. So I looked around the bar, and I found these two uh, bar coasters and a Sharpie, and I really wanted Bob to know how meaningful his friendship had been. So on one side of the coaster I wrote, there's a bluebird in my heart. And on the other side I wrote, thank you for letting it out. Love, Hazel, and then it was followed by my phone number. I handed Bob the Sharpie and I saw that he was writing me a message as well. And then we exchanged coasters and I went to hug him goodbye. And as we hugged, I started to cry. And Bob held me tighter and he whispered in my ear, he said, just go and don't look back. And you keep walking until the motion makes you strong. And do not come looking for me until you have something to talk about. And then he let go. I left the bar that morning feeling completely devastated. And when I got home, I pulled out the coaster to read what Bob had wrote. And on one side of the coaster it said, you are the most vibrant being and on the other side, it said, in our black and white world, take care, Bob. And then it had his phone number. Three years of travels and adventuring later, I started to think about Bob a lot and the fact that all this time had gone by and neither one of us had made an attempt to contact the other. And in thinking about Bob a lot, I was in downtown when I ran into one of the other regulars who told me that the, that the King Eddie had reopened under new management and that it was awful and that all the things that we loved about it were gone and no one drank there anymore except Bob and only sometimes. So one night I decided to go and see if I'd catch Bob. So I walked into the bar one night, just randomly, like on a Tuesday, and then there he was, sitting in the same bar stool in the same corner of the bar. So I pulled up in the bar stool next to him, and when he noticed it was me sitting next to him, he didn't say anything, but he called the bartender over and he ordered my drink. He asked for my drink to be placed on his tab, and when the drink got placed in front of me, he raised his glass for a toast. Do you want to go round for round with me? He asked, to which I said, of course, Bob, I would drink 10 rounds just to sit next to you. And we clinked glasses. 
And just like we had done on all those drinking nights from years prior, we sat there side by side, drinks in hand, smiles on our faces, when Bob turned to me and he casually asked, okay, we're here now. So tell me, how's it been going? Thank you. You. Public speaking ranks higher than death on the list of things people are most afraid of. <laughs> Speaks volumes about the folks joining us on stage today, right? Yeah, yeah. give it up for them. Mm -hmm. Looking for a good way to break through that fear? Improv. You heard about Upright Citizens Brigade earlier. Well, The Groundlings is another of the many LA theaters and schools that offer training in improv, sketch writing, and comedy. They've been at it for 40 years, and it's not always easy to get in. Here to share her story, Amy Ma. One day, I received a misleading marketing email from the Groundlings. The subject line said, classes for everyone, and it advertised an eight-week writing intensive called Writing Chops. Great, I'll brush up on comedy writing and go to the same school that produced Pee Wee Herman, my childhood hero. I clicked into the site, ready to enroll, but something's wrong. I've logged in, and there are enroll buttons next to all the basic courses, but not writing chops. That's weird. Then I see this. You must pass basic improv and or audition to enroll. No, I don't want to start at the bottom of another school. I've done improv elsewhere, and I don't have the time to audition. Even if I could audition, it says a resume headshot is required. Headshots for a writing class? Come on. If I can't take writing chops, what else is there? I don't know what's happening to me, but I'm enraged and angrily clicking into basic courses with no prereqs. Basic improv, improv for teens, improv for, wait a sec. The URL for this class's checkout page ends in three numbers. I click enroll for a different class and it takes me to a new checkout page. Same thing. The URL ends in three unique numbers and the rest of it is all the same. That's it. Three magic numbers are what's needed to access writing chops. Those are the keys to the castle. I click back into basic improv and note the number in the URL address bar, 356. I proceed to change the numbers incrementally, 357, enter, 358, enter, and so on, until I get into a steady rhythm of unlocking these not-so-hidden URLs that lead me to a mother load of basic courses. <laughs> I hit a dead end when I get 505 error, page not found, but no worries. I click enroll for a different class, start at a new number, and this time, go in reverse, in the other numeric direction, changing numbers one at a time. 30 minutes go by, <laughs> and I'm thinking, any day now, it's gonna happen. I'm so close. I see improv for preteens, heck no. Then 619, it's writing chops. I hit the checkout page, but before I get too excited, I see the price tag for writing chops. I consider checking off the employee checkbox rather than student so I can take the class for free. But that would be a dead giveaway and perhaps wrong, so I mark student instead and pay the 400. Yes, I hack my way in to pay them a lot of money, but I am in. I unwittingly discovered that hacking, much like improv, is something anyone can do. And if my prior improv training taught me that no preparation was needed at all, then I was definitely not prepared for the first day of writing chops. 
The first day is the worst because I rush in one hour late, interrupting someone's monologue. Everyone gives me the side eye, and the teacher's grilling me. Who are you? Why are you late? To make things worse, there are two girls in the corner yakking about me. She is late. Who does that? I'm horrified. The teacher scans for my name on the registration list and says, you're not on this list. I have the receipt somewhere. I don't need to see it. Just sign in. Darn it, I've made a horrible impression on everyone, and I'm already thinking, can I take seven more weeks of this? I cannot wait for this to be over. By the second class, I come to realize that nearly everybody is an actor or has some type of professional stage film experience. They all have a serious actor's resume. I have a serious case of imposter syndrome. <laughs> what am I doing here? Everybody seems so eager to read and perform their work in class. But me, I'm the only person asking the teacher, is it OK if someone else reads my monologue or my sketch every single week? There's no way I can do what they do. My fear is an overdrive because I believe the boogeyman on the groundlings payroll will pop in and drag me out saying, get out, you don't belong here. While my internal negative monologue plays on, I also have haters to deal with. One day, I ask Bob to read a part in my sketch. Five minutes later, he throws it back in my lap and says, I think I'll pass. Ouch. I have to constantly remind myself to keep going and not to quit. Finally, it's the last day. I've decided to do what I'm scared of most, which is get up in front of the room and read my own writing. This is my last chance to prove to everyone, especially myself, that I can do it. And it's a good omen, too, that my frenemies, those two chit-chatters from the first day, didn't even bother to show up. I mean, who doesn't show up for the last day of class? <laughs> who does that? <laughs> My name gets called. I step up and announce that I am G.G. Gargoyle, Groundling School Coordinator, who calls up the school webmaster. They're laughing, so I begin. Ring, ring. Hey, Cisco. I'm investigating a student named Amy Ma, and I'm unable to locate her student records. Pull up a search now. What's that? Multiple hits to our site from the same IP address belonging to Amy Ma? A URL hack, huh? She's an infiltrator. As I go on, the light bulbs go off for my classmates. It's the recognition that I am revealing the truth. When I finish my monologue, it's the best feeling I have ever felt. It's the first time I felt like I belonged. Some of them are joking. I'll try this at home. I notice everyone is laughing, except for my teacher, <laughs> who looks slightly confused. OK, you hacked in, but what exactly is a URL? <laughs> I explain it to her, and moments later, she's like, did you pay for the class? You bet. All right, that was funny. I can't believe you did that. I can't believe it either. Now I'm waiting to take Writing Chops 2. Thank you. Now, at the top of tonight's show, Will Choi put you up on Asian AF. With all this talk about comedy and improv, we thought it's only fair to share with you a little more. So please join me in welcoming me to the stage, and I need you to get real loud for this group. Kim Cooper, Kathy Yamamoto, Dhruv Uday Singh, Leland Bowden, and Zach Oyama from Asian AF's improv team, Voltron. <laughs> Get from an audience member one of your favorite places in LA. Malibu. 
Malibu. And uh, whoever said Malibu, uh, what do you like about Malibu? <laughs> Immediately took that down. <laughs> Grand Central Market. <laughs> uh, something you like about Malibu? Anything? The beach. The beach. Good. Uh, is there a person that you go to Malibu with, or a group of people? Mo Geller. Mo Geller. A first and last name. <laughs> uh, is, is Mo a guy, a girl, a friend, a relative? Mo is a triathlon leader. A tri. Triathlon club leader. Oh. Triathlon. Oh. adjective you'd use to describe your friend? Oh my God. <laughs> they're, they're listening right now, so make it cool. Yeah. So awesome. So, so awesome. awesome. Is that enough? Yeah. 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 All right, thank cool. You. Thank you so thank much. You. Five minutes. I can't wait to relax with, you know, like a 15 mile run. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's what getting out of the city is. You know what's weird though? Yeah. We live almost exactly 15 miles inland from Malibu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I invited you. I was going to run back and see if you could get my car back. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not going to hang out at all at the beach? No, I thought you were just doing me a favor. <laughs> I know I'm a good friend to you. Uh -huh. You're taking advantage of me, man. I don't think so. I mean, I feel like I, it's my car and my gas, and you get to be in Malibu. I mean, alone. I thought we were going to go there together, have a meal at Malibu Seafood, get some shrimp. I can't do those, you know, it's like, if I eat a bunch of shrimp before a long run, <laughs> recipe for a disaster, you know? Uh, look, you know, I, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Okay, okay, you'll do me a favor, sir? Yeah, whenever. Okay, great. Well, tomorrow I actually need someone to babysit. I got it. Hey, Luke, you know, I like you, and I really think this relationship is going well, but I gotta know, because you're a triathlon club leader, are you using me for my car? <laughs> I, uh, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. No, 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 that's not what a relationship is. I, I'm your girlfriend. Where it's not about scratching backs unless we like to scratch each other's backs, what? which I do. Yeah. Literally, not to drive you to Malibu. I would love to scratch your back, right? You know, if you like that. But I do have to get going on sort of the swimming section of uh, my training. Uh, <laughs> Look, I don't I want to get it. out there and get embarrassed. Look, right. my last boyfriend was a rugby player, and I am not washing his uniform again. <laughs> I'm looking for a guy who's here with me, not, not someone who looks at me like a human transport. Okay, fine. I know it was just your example, but I won't scratch your back. <laughs> you do have this. <laughs> Sign-ups, should we do it? Uh, I mean, we've been wanting to try something new. And this is something very new. Yeah, I mean, neither one of us has run in 20 years. years. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, though? I have, I set a goal for myself that I was going to get 5,000 steps on my Fitbit every day. <laughs> and I have been getting that. <laughs> so push yourself further. Yeah, so push myself further. Why not? You know, we spent so much time at our desks. We should really... We should really just get out there. Yeah. Cut to halfway through the triathlon. <laughs> oh my god! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we made a commitment! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> uh, so that's, uh, that's my resume, of course. That's my work experience. I was in college for four years for accounting. Oh, great. And, uh, oh, some, some of my, oh, sorry. Were you going to say something? Oh, I was just going to ask, uh, can you tell me what your favorite thing uh -huh. about Harvard was? Oh, oh I regret talking about Harvard. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't really want to, I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry I asked. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> sorry, I just, I had a bad time at Harvard. Oh. Okay. I went there for college, obviously, but I didn't love it. Okay, uh, <laughs> I, we don't have to dwell on that. Um, can you tell me what your favorite thing 
about being the manager at Staples was. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> I'll talk about, you know, fountain pens, you know, I'll tell you about Well, yeah, that's not on your resume. That's yeah. something on my desk. Okay, I mean, I can... Uh, okay. Okay, I just got to know something about you. If you want to... Okay, I lied, okay? My resume has a bunch of lies on it. Oh, my gosh. I didn't go to Harvard. I was a manager at Staples. You weren't a manager at Staples. <laughs> that's a, that's a, first of all, I thought, oh, what a strange thing for a graduate of Harvard. I know. <laughs> um, and then why lie about something that's like a mid... Because I started with the lies that were really big and grand, and then I thought I should make these lies more realistic, so as you notice, it gets better. <laughs> okay. Like my last work experience, you know? It just says I, I walk dogs half an hour a day. Do you do that? No. Oh. <laughs> that, that's, that's a lie that you could actually make a truth. There's an app. You could sign up on an app. And that, okay, you know, I, I'm not going to kick you out. Okay, if, you're, you're not? If I'm honest, uh -huh. we haven't been doing so well, and, we're, and we've been trying to recruit the right type of talent Great. at this Petco. <laughs> Tell me anything about yourself, something truthful, anything. Okay, um, uh, I was, okay, yeah, I grew up um, uh, in Leningrad. Did you really? <laughs> oh my god, are you so excited for a romantic weekend oh, in Malibu? I can't wait. Uh, I know. Uh, needed this. I know. We haven't left the driveway yet. Just, oh, just yeah. <laughs> I'm just waiting. Uh, Mo is going to come. Mo's coming. Mo? Oh. Mo? We're going to Malibu, so you get in the car. Oh, wait. Mo, wait. Was, oh, was it Mo Kaiser or, or Mo, Mo Miller? Mo oh. Miller. Oh, sorry. Not me. Yeah. <laughs> I always have to go to Malibu with Mo. Yeah. It's just can, like the thing. Can you just wait for one second, Mo? Sure, it's just super windy out here. Yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to be like a romantic trip. It's not going to be that if Mo is awesome. Do we have like another hotel room for him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mo has some like. God, he's so cold. <laughs> oh, thank you. Sorry, was that still Mo Kaiser? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a two. It's a two. It's only a two seater, but you can fit. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go right. Yeah. yeah. Go, please don't. I just every time I every time I've gone to Malibu, every time I've gone to Malibu since we were in college, it's just me and Mo always go together. So really, it just feels really like just not right, right? If I went to Malibu without you, that would be so crazy. That's that's nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's Ready, baby? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> Stick my hand out the window. Honey, that's really Mo's window. So. <laughs> Oh, wait, wait. So, an Did you say Mo? I'm a Mo. Mo Radford? Oh, no. Oh, um. You heard us driving? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're just halfway down a driveway. <laughs> no, this, this, this Mo. Oh, Mo. Mo, 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 like Mo, Mo Miller. <laughs> uh, hey, um. Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry to, sorry to come by. I know you guys are the, the landlords for this whole street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm from the Housing Commission. It seems like you've exclusively been renting to people with the first name Mo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of discriminatory. You can't, you can't do that. You can't just have... Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's not discriminatory. We have Mo's of all races, all gender, <laughs> all sexual orientation. That, yeah. Also, like, I'm not be having preferential treatment. It's just that I see someone and they've got something I like, mm -hmm. you know? What? I just, when, sometimes when you meet someone, you know, you just see that they're so awesome, you yeah. know, and you pat them in your life. Right, but it seems like the only people you think are awesome have the first name Mo. I am here about the apartment. Uh, I have a 12.30 appointment. What? My name's Greg Stevenson. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. SPI. 
of 75. <laughs> <laughs> Take no risks. Mm. I would say my favorite part about Malibu is the beach. Wouldn't you guys agree? <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to take off my jacket. Um, I think you're right. SPF 75 is the way to go. Or yeah. just protecting your skin. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I brought a pop-up tent as well. If oh, you want. great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a big sun person, so. I love I the beach. Yeah. Yes, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And it actually it comes with walls as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, this is crazy. But I, I also brought my laptop that's loaded with a bunch of movies. Oh, <laughs> if we want to just perfect. Watch a movie. I brought a flat screen TV. Yeah. <laughs> Is our show. Can we get everybody back out here on stage? You gotta keep clapping. Keep clapping. Keep it up. Keep clapping. Come on out. Come on out. Everybody. Oh, you can come up a little further. There we go. Nice, nice. Good round of applause. Okay, now, real quick. So this is an experiment. Uh, we need y'all to help us out. So if you would, take out your phones, ignore all the texts from your kids that you missed, and we need you to let us know if you'd come to another Unheard LA. So text Unheard LA to 63735 and answer two quick questions. And make sure you check the spelling. Don't let autocorrect get the best of you. And if you want to see another Unheard LA show, let us know, all right? And you'll find more information at kpcc.org slash unheardla. So thank you, John and Ashley and the entire KPCC in-person team, including photographer Bill Youngblood. Thank you also to Quetzal for use of Unbound from the album The Eternal Get Down. There we go. And thank you to all of our generous storytellers, Asian AF and Voltron, the Rosenthal Theater at Inner City Arts, and the California Wellness Foundation. Most importantly, thank you for coming out. We'll be at the mixer while I encourage you to meet someone new and tell them where you're from. Don't leave here tonight with your story unheard. Bless you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>